So welcome back to part two of my lecture on the Birch and Sunderton Dyer conjecture. So now we're going to shift things, shift gears from the algebraic side to the analytic side, because remember ultimately we want to show that the analytic rank and algebraic rank are supposed to be equal for this conjecture to be true. So why do we use analytic functions? What do we mean by analytic functions? We mean like calculus functions. So essentially we're using calculus analysis to study number theory. It's kind of strange, but calculus functions, uh, using calculus can answer questions about statements about the integers, statements about primes and things like that. So they're actually useful. And dating back to Euler's time in the early to mid 1700s, he, uh, he used analytic functions already at that time to study instead of just making pure what you think of as pure number theoretic arguments. So here's an example. The prime number theorem, one of the kind of basic results in number theory, says these two functions are asymptotic. The, the number of primes less than x, which is pi of x, that's sort of asymptotic to this function x over ln of x. So they kind of grow at the same rate. So this is an analytic function. This is just a the spits out integers, but they're very closely related, so their limit is actually equal to 1. So that's kind of interesting. So that's that. Now here's another motivation on why we use analytic functions. Now this is a non-rigorous proof, and I simplified it just a hair, just to make it <coughs> easier to visualize. So back in Euler's time that we mentioned, like, you know, 1720, 1730, something like that. He came up with a proof on the infinitude of primes. What does that mean? That means the number of primes is infinite. There are, there's no finite list of primes that compose all the integers. So here, let's consider the idea that the number of primes is finite. So we look at the harmonic series, series 1 over n. And it's 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 and so forth. It goes on forever. So just ignore the fact for a moment that this diverges. And let's just write it out as a product. Now each integer has a unique factorization up to powers of primes. In other words, 6 can only be written as 2 times 3 when it's factored. You know, in its most factored form, 12 is 2 times 2 you know, 2 squared times 3, and so forth. So, here's how we think of it. We think of this sum here. Notice this is a sum over all the reciprocals of the integers. So what we do is we take the reciprocals of all the powers of the primes, and we multiply them all out. And this will be the same. So for instance, if we had over here, out here, uh, if we had 1 over 12, how would we get 1 over 12 from this product here? Well, so we mentioned we need the 1 over 2 squared, and we need a 1 over 3. So 1 fourth times 1 third, that'll be 12. And we just take the, the 1 from each of the other parentheses here, and out, and keep going out. And that'll give you the 1 twelfth. And so that's how, you, that's how these two lines are equal. So you can think about that. And so then we just combine this formally to a product. This symbol here, if you're not familiar with it, is the Euler product. It just means we take this thing here, not for not just for one prime, but for, for each prime. So these are the same thing. But then we notice that this is a geometric series of ratio 1 over p. So we write this argument here as a geometric series from calculus 2. And we have a formula to compute the sum for a geometric series. And it's one that you should always remember. So it's the first term over 1 minus the ratio. In this case the first term is 1. And 1 minus the ratio, as we mentioned, it's 1 over p. Such as you get. And this is unnecessary, but if you just multiply by p over p, you get this here. But now this is a product over the primes. If the number of primes is finite, then this is a finite product. That's going to give us some number, isn't it? 
But what's the problem with that? If we look at our original series here, it's supposed to diverge, isn't it? The harmonic series, it's a well-known fact that the harmonic series diverges, and you can show that by the integral test. So we got something that was infinite is actually something finite. That can't be true. So that's the idea. So this gives you a little idea on why uh, analytic functions, calculus functions, can help us uh, understand number theory questions better. So now we're easing into the idea of the L function. So L function is kind of the, the important character in, in this conjecture. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like, it looks very similar to the Riemann zeta function. If you're not familiar with the Riemann zeta function, it's this right here. It's a summation of 1 over n to the s, where s is complex, complex number. And the L function looks very similar, only the coefficients are different. So it's kind of the same form, but its coefficients are a little bit different. And we'll talk where we talk about where we get those coefficients in just just a minute. So the common idea in number theory is so number theorists are always trying to understand what's happening with rational numbers, but what we can consider is what happens when we reduce those rational numbers to a field of size p. In other words, mod p. So you reduce an integer you reduce an integer mod p, like 100, uh, mod 5, that's 0, and so forth. Just take whatever rational number you have and just reduce it, mod p. Alright, and so here's a theorem by Haas in 1933, which was a long time ago. He came up with this idea here, and he proved it that for the elliptic curve where all the x and y coordinates are chosen to come from the prime field, that the size of the elliptic curve differs from p plus 1 by this constant times root p. So this is sort of a upper bound for the difference between these two guys. Normally when Hass's theorem is written it's not doesn't use these parentheses. I included the parentheses to kind of show that actually what we're interested in is the difference between these two guys. Because in general we would ex we expect this to be close to this. The size of e of f of p is close to p plus 1. And it's close by this sort of ratio. And you might not be sure about like how good that this sort of estimate is. So I made a little table here for a bunch of different primes. And you can see that when the prime is small, like 11, the by comparison, the factor to root p is pretty close to p. But as we get p is really large, like a nine digit prime here, the two root p is it's only a five digit number. So this estimate gets better and better the bigger the primes get. So that's that. So we'll make use of that in a little bit. So we're always concerned about like how close p plus 1 is to the size of e of, p, e of f of p. All right, so now we're going to talk about these coefficients here. Remember back when we had the, we defined the L function, we had those a of n's. So n was just an integer in general. We're going to talk about how we get these a of p's for p prime. And that'll help us get the a of n's. So for elliptic curves, we have these notion, this notion of good primes and bad primes. So what are good primes, what are bad primes? So basically the idea is that when you reduce the discriminant of the elliptic curve mod p, if you don't get zero, then that's good. Why is that good? Remember that for an elliptic curve, we need the discriminant to be non-zero. So if it was non-zero to begin with, and then you reduced it mod p and you still got something that was non-zero, that means that when you took the elliptic curve over the rationals and you reduced it down that you got another elliptic curve. That's not always the case. Sometimes when you take the discriminant and then you reduce it mod p for some p, 
you actually get zero. So you don't get an elliptic curve in that in that case. And that's not what we want. So we call that bad p. So for the good p's, we define these this coefficients here, a sub p, by p plus one minus size of the elliptic curve mod p. And so that looks very similar to what we talked about in the last slide. So for example here, if we have an elliptic curve, here's an example, an example of an elliptic curve, and you can show pretty quickly, you can, with pen and paper, you can quickly see that the only solutions to this mod 5 are, the, well there's four of them. And don't forget to include the the identity at infinity in that. So there's three, and then there's another one, let me call that a the identity. So there's four total. So the way we define a sub 5 is we take p plus 1 minus the size and that gives us our a sub p. And here's just here's yet another example. The only reason why I included two examples was to show that a sub p's can actually be negative as well. So they don't have to just be strictly positive. So they're going to be in integers but uh, not necessarily positive integers. So we can think of these a sub p's as sort of a correction factor to the size of the elliptic curve mod p, and p plus 1. This is sort of the estimate on the size, and uh, so this difference here, well, it'll be the sort of correction factor. So it also makes sense to talk about a sub p to the n. Why does this make sense? Because you may be aware that for fields, the size of fields, for finite fields, is always p to the power of some integer. So the size of fields are always primed to some power. You can't have a field that's size 6. You can have a field size 9. So 6 is not a power of a prime, but 9 is a power of a prime. So we define the a sub p to the n's naturally to just wherever you see a p, you include the p to the n. So that's how that works. So we talked about how, how to get the a sub p's for the bad p's, or for the good p's, but how about for the bad p's? So the a sub p's for bad p's are defined to be 0, 1, or negative 1, depending on the type of reduction. So remember what we're talking about with bad p's is when you reduce that discriminant mod p you get a zero and that's gonna make sh that's gonna mean that our elliptic curve is gonna have singularities so we're not gonna call that an elliptic curve. It's gonna have some type of singularity like a node which is a self intersection or a cusp which you can kind of imagine that shape kind of like a V shape or something like that. Okay. So we notice that the number of bad primes is finite. This is very useful to us. Why is the number of bad primes finite? So the number of so the prime is bad if we if essentially p divides this discriminant here because that discriminant will reduce to zero mod p. So that's the same thing as saying that p will divide the discriminant. Well, if you go out farther, far enough, then there's no way that p is going to divide this discriminant. So eventually, all the discriminants will be non-zero. So if you're talking about looking at reducing the elliptic curve mod p, eventually you're not going to have a problem with bad p's. So that's that. So now we just remember the formula that we gave earlier for the L function. And now we have an idea of what these a sub n's actually mean. And this is how we define the a sub n. So every integer n has a unique factorization up to powers of primes. And so we define the a sub n's, these coefficients for this series here, by the product of all the a sub p's to the n's. And this product converges for the real part of s greater than 3 halves. And there's a couple ways to show that, but uh, so that's that. So it doesn't 
converge when s equals 1. So notice 3 halves, that's close to 1. Why am I making that observation? Because actually in this conjecture what we're interested in is when s equals 1. We'll talk about that. Actually, we'll talk about that right now. Okay, so even though the series that we talked about just a minute ago doesn't converge when s equals 1, Andrew Wiles, who's a very famous mathematician, he did some work that proved that the L function for elliptic curves extends to be an entire function. What does entire function mean? So if you haven't had complex analysis, it means it's complex differentiable everywhere. Like it's 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 like the equivalent for sort of uh, real functions saying that the function is differentiable everywhere. Like, for instance, the function y equals x squared, that's differentiable everywhere for every value of x. And the function y equals the absolute value of x, that's differentiable everywhere except at x equals 0. So Andrews Weil's work showed that it makes sense to talk about when s equals 1 for the L function for elliptic curves. And so what we do is we write the L function as a power series centered at s equals 1, a Taylor series. And we just leave off the first r terms that are, not, that are 0. So the way we get these Taylor series coefficients, if you remember from calculus, is we take the, the, rth, the rth coefficient will be the rth derivative over r factorial. And you can find that formula in any calculus book for Taylor series. So if if it's zero, then we just leave it off. And so we just start at the first non-zero one. And so that's the analytic rank. We call that the analytic rank of the elliptic curve. So notice that if if it's non-zero, that means that the rth derivative is non-zero. So what what this analytic rank is, it's just the first it's the first non-zero derivative of the L function when s equals one. So that's how we get the coefficients, and that's what that means. So said differently, it's the order of vanishing of the L function when s equals one. So those are equivalent. The order of vanishing of the of the function when s equals 1, it's the first non-zero derivative evaluated at s equals 1. Said differently, it's the first non-zero coefficient in the Taylor series centered at s equals 1. So that's the analytic rank of the elliptic curves. So now we've talked about both of them, so now it makes sense to state our conjecture. This is the Birch and Swinnerton dyer conjecture. And it says that if we have an elliptic curve defined over the rationals, the order of vanishing at s equals 1 of the L function is the rank of the elliptic curve, is the, is the algebraic rank. So those two things are equal. And then the second sentence you can look at, it's restating it slightly different way, slightly more technical way. So that's the conjecture. And I think that's a good stopping point for right now. And we'll go on in part three to talk a little bit more about that and explain more details and things like that. So I hope you'll check that out. All right, thanks for watching.